and welcome. The late 80s was an unusual time for the superhero genre. Following the success and acclaim of Watchmen and The Dark Knight Returns, mainstream publishers allowed creators the opportunity to explore edgier, darker territory. The intent of these comics was to depict a more realistic approach to violence and its consequences. The results were, as one might expect, a mixed bag of scowling characters that questioned their own motivations, usually through rambling, morally conflicted internal monologues. This is a period known as the grim and gritty era of mainstream comics. Early into this trend came the satirical, hyper-violent character Martial Law. Martial Law was an unbalanced mix of Judge Dredd, the Punisher, and all the self-loathing that Joy Division used to sing about. Martial Law is, quite possibly, the ultimate anti-hero. Martial Law was created by the writer Pat Mills and the artist Kevin O'Neill. This creative team had worked together quite frequently prior to Martial Law, most notably on the long-running feature Nemesis the Warlock for 2000 AD. It's fairly well known that Pat Mills unapologetically hates superheroes, and this dislike of the genre is quite apparent in Martial Law. It teems with disdain. It reads like an open hate letter to the industry. His objection to the genre appears to have two specific but related points. Superheroes, at their core, are ridiculous male power fantasies. And, unfortunately, this genre has taken over the comic book medium. Generally speaking, when people think of comic books, they first think of superheroes. That genre has become so prevalent that other works are either overlooked or dismissed as anomalies. This is a perception that has changed somewhat in recent years, but in 1987, when the first miniseries was published, this was the public perception of the industry. Comic books meant superheroes. Understandably, for a writer who enjoys working in the medium, but has no interest in superheroes, this can lead to a fair amount of contempt. This contempt translates very clearly within the Martial Law series. It should be noted that the artist, Kevin O'Neill, has one notorious distinction. The short story, Tigers, written by Alan Moore and illustrated by O'Neill, which appeared in Green Lantern Corps Annual No. 2, was rejected as unsuitable when submitted to the Comics Code Authority. When DC asked for clarification, the censors responded by saying the art style itself was objectionable. DC subsequently printed the 1986 annual without code approval. Therefore, O'Neill is the only known artist to have his actual art style deemed inappropriate for the general public. It's possible this unusual, seemingly capricious ruling by the Comics Code inspired O'Neill to enhance the more obscene or grotesque aspects of his artwork within martial law. Martial Law originally debuted as a six-issue miniseries in 1987. It was published by the Marvel Comics creator-owned imprint, Epic Comics. Retroactively, the first miniseries is known as Fear and Loathing. The series takes place in the wreckage of San Francisco, renamed San Futuro, following a devastating earthquake. Living in the ruins of the city are the superpowered soldiers that America created to fight in an unjust war. With the war over, these damaged, aggressive individuals run wild in the city, unable to adjust to normal life. These former soldiers have formed gangs to terrorize the civilian population and to wage a pointless war with one another. Violence is the language they speak fluently. The only law in the city is martial law. Ostensibly, he's there to ensure these superheroes don't cause too much mayhem. But he's a bitter, disillusioned former super soldier who usually ends up taking out his existential rage on those he formerly served with during the war. He believes he's the brutal solution to an equally brutal problem. The main plot of the original series is martial law investigating and trying to stop a series of brutal rapes and murders. Not that one should downplay the seriousness of rape and murder, but solving these crimes are not really what the series is about. These crimes are the call to action, the inciting event that brings martial law into the story and progresses it further. What the series is actually about is it's a deconstruction of the violent people we often label as heroes. It examines the line between those that commit violence because it's their duty and those that commit violence because it's their calling. And that line is a lot blurrier than we care to admit. At its core, the series is a dark satire of the grim and gritty era of comic books and the hypocritical levels of violence the heroes engage in to make the world a better place. It openly embraces, then parodies, popular superheroes. At the same time, it's an even worse example of the very thing it's mocking. That's an incredible balancing act, and it's something that is very easy to get wrong, but martial law gets it right. 
the character of martial law, not only personifies self-loathing, because he is literally no different than the people he abuses and then arrests, but also the disillusionment one feels as a romantic idealist stuck in an environment that only responds to cheap violence. Martial law knows what he is, and he hates it. He hates everything about it. He doesn't want to be a violent, law-enforcing thug, but that's what is expected of him. And furthermore, it's the only thing he knows how to be. So he accepts this, and seemingly revels in it. It's a vicious, self-inflicted cycle that both encourages and eases the pain of that self-awareness. The design of martial law's uniform screams self-harm. The mask has a perpetual frown of disdain and two bright red zipper slashes along the cheeks. There's an additional zipper slash along his throat. The red line down the middle of his face, intersecting with his mouth, creates an inverted cross, which suggests his faith, if he has faith in anything, is the inverse of peace and love. His right arm is exposed, with barbed wire wrapped around it. Presumably, this keeps him in a perpetual state of discomfort and pain, which is the constant of his existence. Everything about the uniform indicates he despises himself and the duty he's been called to perform. Martial law believes his nemesis is the public spirit, one of the first superheroes created through radical genetic manipulation. Suitably, the public spirit is an analog to Superman, the wholesome character that inspired the entire superhero genre. The public spirit, as the name implies, motivates many, including martial law himself, to go through this radical procedure and become a superhero. Unfortunately, this process is unpredictable, and the results wildly vary. This produces individuals with ridiculous, very pointless powers or capabilities. For the most part, those that elect to become a superhero actually become victims. In turn, they perpetuate a cycle of victimization by terrorizing those around them. This is the major reason why martial law focuses on the public spirit. He feels victimized by the false ideal the public spirit represents. This betrayal transformed martial law from being an idealist into being a fascist. Martial law's diminished capacity to feel pain inspires his need to inflict a disproportionate amount of it on the subject of his existential disgust and shame. Martial law needs the public spirit to be publicly humbled and revealed to be a fraud. This would be martial law's revenge and, ultimately, his redemption. He focuses on this task to the exclusion of all evidence that suggests the public spirit is innocent of the crimes martial law believes he's committed. Overall, this miniseries is filled with a high degree of background detail, interesting elements, and a very clear allusion to the Vietnam War. The resolution of the story is also appropriate, and it concludes with a very memorable scene. There is a progression of martial law's character, and, for a moment, it appears that he's made peace with the inner turmoil that fuels him. For a series that explores ridiculous levels of violence, with a character that is seemingly unredeemable, it actually ends on a poignant, revealing note. The second martial law comic, Crime and Punishment, or Martial Law Takes Manhattan, was originally written to include popular Marvel characters such as Spider-Man, the Fantastic Four, and Captain America. Presumably, due to their unflattering portrayals, Marvel demanded the characters be changed. As a result, these characters became obvious duplicates of the originals. Unsurprisingly, after this one-shot, future martial law comics were published by other companies. The plot to this one-shot is quite thin. Martial law enters a mental institution to take down an individual known as the Persecutor, who is a thinly veiled version of the Punisher. Overall, it's a parody of supergroups, the Avengers and the Fantastic Four in particular, and it's a brutal examination of CIA tactics utilized during wartime. As a follow-up to the original miniseries, it maintains both the atmosphere originally established and the satirical, self-righteous tone but it lacks the depth of the first miniseries. While the examination and the history of the persecutor is quite well done, the rest of the story gleefully punches down, so to speak. It is an orgy of violence with the thinnest premise to sustain it. One can find some grim amusement in the patriotic Captain America sucking his thumb, or the human torch perpetually screaming in agony because he's always on fire, but these seem like obvious areas to highlight with satire. While there's nothing wrong with any of these satirical interpretations, they do feel a bit pointless to the story, which may be the significance of their inclusion. The point being, these superhero characters are absurd and unnecessary. However, this point lacks any subtlety, and this diminishes its impact. Following this, Martial Law would have two one-shots published by Apocalypse Comics, 
Kingdom of the Blind, and The Hateful Dead, the latter being a reprint of material Pat Mills and Kevin O'Neill produced for their own magazine, Toxic. Dark Horse would publish the next miniseries, Super Babylon, in 1992, when both Apocalypse Comics and Toxic suspended publication. This was followed by Secret Tribunal in 1993. The final three miniseries were crossovers with other properties. There was Pinhead vs. Martial Law in 1993, The Savage Dragon and Martial Law in 1997, and, finally, The Mask and Martial Law in 1998. While none of these follow-ups are inherently bad, they merely continue the tradition established by crime and punishment. All have a basic premise, followed by ridiculous levels of violence, featuring transparent analogs to well-known characters or groups. Basically, the satire is put aside, and the series becomes pure parody and violent slapstick. It's a less interesting approach, and quite shallow, but it is effective in delivering the opinion that the superhero genre is ridiculous and the most absurdly ridiculous character of all is Martial Law. In the end, the first Martial Law miniseries is a nearly perfect blueprint of how to satirize the superhero genre. There is character progression, an antagonist with an understandable motivation, sympathetic side characters that contribute to the tone and atmosphere, and the story has a solid resolution with an emotional core. Quite simply, it's a series with a layered, critical point of view that is explored in a satisfying manner.